So welcome back. This is the second of two episodes all about franchising. Last week, we covered the franchisee side. Today, we're covering the franchisor side. So you got a brand that's growing. You think there's opportunity. It's got legs. You want to franchise it out. What do you need to know? How do you know whether you're ready and what are the steps you need to take? That's largely the question uh, that we're going to answer on today's episode of Restaurant Strategy. There's an old saying that goes something like this. You'll only find three kinds of people in the world. Those who see, those who will never see, and those who can see when shown. This is Restaurant Strategy, a podcast with answers for anyone who's looking. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Chip Close, and this is Restaurant Strategy, a podcast dedicated solely to helping you build a more profitable and a more sustainable business. I work with owners and operators all over the world. I leverage my 20 plus years in the industry to help you build that more profitable and sustainable enterprise. If you're ever curious about learning more about my mastermind, the group I run, it's called the P3 Mastermind, then I urge you to get in touch. The three P's stand for profit, process, and progress. And we work with uh, operators all over the world to help them build more profitability in their business. To get started, visit restaurantstrategypodcast.com slash schedule. Set up a free 30-minute strategy session with me. I'll get to learn more about you and your business. You'll get to ask some questions about the program to see if you're a good fit for the program. There is no pressure to move forward, but if at the end of that call, you decide it's a good fit, we can talk about next steps. Again, Restaurant Strategy Podcast dot com slash schedule. As always, you'll find that link in the show notes. Now, thousands of restaurants across the country use Kickfin to send instant cashless tip payouts directly to their employees' bank accounts the second their shift ends. It's a really simple solution to a really big problem because let's face it, paying out cash tips to your workers day after day, shift after shift, is kind of a nightmare. Tedious tip distribution takes managers away from work that matters. It's hard to track payments, which leads to accounting and compliance headaches. Plus, cash tip outs create the perfect opportunity for theft. And there's never enough cash on hand to pay out those tips, so managers are constantly having to make bank runs. Bottom line, there's never been a secure, efficient way to tip out until now. Meet Kickfin. Kickfin is an easy-to-use software that sends real-time, cashless tip payouts straight to your employees' bank accounts 24-7, 365. Tipping out with Kickfin gives managers and operators hours back in their day. It makes reporting a breeze and protects your business from mistakes and theft. And guess what? Employees love it, so it's one of the best recruiting tools out there. Best of all, restaurants can have Kickfin up and running literally overnight. Employees can enroll in seconds, no hardware, no contracts, no setup fees. Get in touch today for a personalized demo and see how restaurants and bars across the country are tipping out with Kickfin. Visit kickfin.com slash demo. As always, you will find that link in the show notes. Now, today is uh, the second part uh, in a two-part series. Uh, it's a franchise roundtable. Uh, I know very little about franchising. If you listened to last week's episode, was the first part of this two-part episode, uh, you'll find that that's absolutely true. Um, I, um, I don't know it enough, so I just tried to ask questions that, uh, that struck me, um, and I was told uh, I was wrong or asking the wrong question, and that was great because I'm happy to ask the stupid questions to save uh, anyone out there from asking the stupid questions, though there are no stupid questions. I'm happy to do it. Um, today, again, we've got our panel together. Again, Lauren Fernandez, Daryl Sangster, uh, Troy Hooper. Um, I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, welcome back. We are going to talk about the franchisor side of things. So if you missed last week's episode, I would urge you to go back. Um, they uh, gave context to who they are, what they do, and why all three of them, I think, are qualified to be here talking on this subject. Um, if you missed the first episode, uh, I think it's worth just pausing here, going back and listening to last week's because there's a ton of great information. Plus, you get to know who, who's actually uh, who's actually talking to you in this week's episode. I'm not going to bother going through uh, the bio because they already did it, um, but I'm welcoming again. Welcome them back, Lauren, Daryl, and Troy. Today, uh, last week, we talked all about the franchisees. Um, how do you know whether you should open an independent uh, restaurant or buy into a franchise? What are the things you should, uh, what are the considerations, all of that? There was a great conversation last week. And then today, we're going to have the other side, right? The franchisor side. So 
I have an independent restaurant. Uh, I'm I'm building a brand, and now I want to grow the brand. Let's start at the at the very basic question: How do you begin to know whether it's time to grow or this is the right path, as opposed to just opening uh, a bunch of units, uh, you know, a bunch of corporate units? Daryl, I'm going to start with you uh, on today's episode. Talk, talk to me how you begin. To, to suss that out, whether that's this is the right move. Yeah, so you know, I think the um, the the growth pattern of what you envision for your brand is is a critical question at the start. So, are you going to uh, self fund this uh, through corporate uh, units? Are you going to build because you know again corporately there's there's a maximum capacity that that you'll get to uh, before lending stops. Um, and from from the franchise side, um, there they have to look at: Do I want to be in the people management side and and the coaching side of this? So if if I love being in the kitchen and and that's where I'm, that fills my heart to to see everybody happy and and doing that. Becoming a franchisor might not be your thing because you're going to be building this this organization and this, you're going to be in an office environment and you're going to be coaching other franchisees to build. So um, I, I have had that experience of talking with um, people and businessmen and women that that were sitting on the fence on what to franchise or, or not. and. And, and it, I think it is a question that you do have to really dig into and go, what does my next 10 or 15 years look like in my own personal life? Because I can either build this thing, but I, I will be managing people, or do I, do I want to spend my time in the kitchen or on the, on the floor? Yeah, Lauren, do you, do you agree with that? Or is there anything you'd add to that? How, yeah. how do they begin to say whether this is where, where we should go? Yeah, I think there's a couple misconceptions on franchising and, and franchising as a growth vehicle. And one is that it's going to get you rich very quickly overnight without having to do any work. And I think that couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, it does take a lot of work to set up a cohesive and thriving franchise system. And that includes overhead expense, not just in the setup of the franchise system, but in operating it and supporting your franchisees. Um, I don't think there's there's any question that there are some certainly um, some very large financial rewards attached to robust franchise royalty streams when you go to exit. I mean, in the marketplace, we've seen anywhere from 14x to 19x or more on established franchise systems and their royalty streams. And so that's why I think I see a lot of more equity players in this space really want to lean into franchising as the preferred growth model. But as a brand owner, I think you have to consider there are many ways to grow your business, company stores, non-traditional units, international expansion, product development. Um, and I think all of those deserve just as equal an analysis um, as to your future vision for where the brand is growing. And I'll also say, I think there's a misconception that you lose control when you franchise a brand. And actually, I think that couldn't be farther from the truth either. I think that franchising does give franchisors a reasonable amount of control in the execution and the quality with which the brand is used by franchisees, whereas you may not even have that level of control over over your own company stores. I've seen it. Um, so I, I look at franchising as one of many vehicles with which to grow your brand. And I will second what Daryl's saying. I think you have to have the end game in mind. What are your objectives as, uh, as an owner? What's your end game and what's your exit going to look like? I think if you start with that in mind, the right ways to grow your business will certainly manifest themselves. Yeah, I love it. Troy. This is every day of my life. The phone <laughs> rings. Somebody's got a great, a great concept and a, and a thriving business, and they're they're ready to blow it up. Um, it, bo both of them, of course, have said all the right things. The uh, first thing I say to people along Daryl's comment is: Are you ready to start a new company and run an entirely new type of business? And are you ready to service other people for a fee? Right? Are you ready to provide the services, support, um, and materials, and 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 can you and do you want to do that 
for a living because you are no longer going to be a restaurant owner. That's just the way it's going to be. Your focus is going to shift. Um, it's a mindset game. Uh, it's a resources game. To Lauren's point, uh, I, I get a lot of, hey, I did the math. If I sell 100 of these at $40,000 a fee, look, at the end of the day, if you can operate a functional and thriving franchise or organization based on fee, you would be the 1% of the 1%. Um, it's a losing proposition. That is a subsidy, uh, not a uh, funding mechanism for standing up this organization. Um, so to that point, are you actually capable of standing up even the, the base level functional operational system uh, with the team needed to just even get off the ground? I do not want to be the sourpuss of the group, but I do want to bring a very sobering statistic to the table. Every year, across all genres of franchise, on average, 225 new franchise brands become offered. They register. They have an FDD available. They are legally selling or offering a franchise. And almost exactly the same number of franchise systems close down or don't renew their registration status, etc. It's almost a one-for-one. One. So the second sobering stat is that over half of all franchise systems have less than five locations, right? And, and that number moves a little bit and it may not be dead accurate, so some people may call it out. I have some friends that know that number to the T every day. But the reality is, is many people try to go down this path and at the first, second, or third hurdle, um, it becomes a barrier they're not willing to climb over and fight through, right? And so we see them get stuck. And so another pie in the sky mindset um, is not a winning business strategy. This is going to take a lot of education, information, a lot of help. It's going to take money to pay for that help in a lot of respects. And, um, and, and, it, and you need to think long and hard. And, and it is not something to be done lightly or on your own. And we do get a lot of phone calls of, hey, I franchised two years ago. I sold one or three units. One or all of them have closed. I sold them to my friends and family and cousins and neighbors. Um, and then we dig in and we realize they basically bought an off-the-shelf package templated system with no support, no education, um, and and they're failing or they're not they're not getting started, really. They never even get off the ground. Um, and, and so now they're looking for help in that. And, and in a lot of ways, I just want to say again, from a cautionary standpoint, um, it costs you more to fix what you didn't do right the first time than just doing it right the first time. Always. I love it. Uh, I couldn't have imagined 90% uh, of what you guys just said there. Um, so thank you for kicking off this conversation with tons, really high value. Um, I want to talk about how we stress test a brand at that moment of, hey, we think this is something. This can grow, right? So maybe we got one really ex uh, really successful unit. Maybe we've extend uh, expanded to three or five, um, you know, successful units. We've sort of replicated. So we did it in one space. That worked. We opened up another one. Hey, that worked. We opened up another one. So we've got maybe five corporate units, and we go, hey, man, we're ready to blow this thing up. How do you stress test a brand at that moment? I don't know who wants to jump in there. You guys just duke it out. I'll tell you what we do first and foremost is we evaluate the profitability at a unit, just 100%. It's a unit level economics exercise. And what I tell okay. brands all the time, and this is very simple to understand, it has to be profitable at a place where an owner doesn't have to be in position. So that's a perfect scenario when I was referring to you in our last session, like, hey, if you want to be a franchisee, are you operating that unit on a daily basis or can you take home profit while there's still a manager running the day-to-day -day operations? But more importantly, if you're a franchisor and you're running a business, let's say the profit margin is 18%. 
a franchisee has to actually make five to seven percent more than that in profit margin because you're taking it right off the top as a franchisor. So for many brands, this is going to be mind blowing, but you got to have a profit margin that's north of 22 to 25 percent for it to be an attractive offering to a franchisee where those unit level economics will transfer into their universe. And so many for so many brands, I cannot tell you 90% of the time, this is a gate, this is a gatekeeping exercise. This is a no go zone because they haven't tuned their unit level economics to a place where it's an attractive franchise offering. And it's just that simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Daryl. Yeah, you know, I I absolutely agree with Lauren on that. Um, You know, the uh, to to a little bit of Troy's background, I think the the system side um, is is critical to this to because you can have um, uh, a profitable business uh, that is making some money, um, but it's not easy to run. Now you might might you know have ten years under your belt, so you know it inside and out, and you can juggle you know a, a, a thousand little pieces. But when you look at the system side of that business, can you replicate that and teach? somebody those thousand systems and if the answer is no then you shouldn't be considering that because you gotta you gotta build a franchise system that is easier to follow as opposed to hard great so again so when we're talking about stress testing it number one is the profitability just the unit level straight operating profit where are we operating at it's got to be north of 22 25 percent so that when we lob off the royalty, it's still gonna be handsome for the franchisee. Um, Daryl, the the systems have to be in place, which again, Troy, my systems guy, uh, I'm sure you, you love that. So, but there's gotta be systems in place and sort of, and that's on the heels of what Lauren was saying, right? Like, is the owner there making sure that everything's happening all the time or have they put a system into place so it can very successfully and profitably um, and predictably, I, I talk about predictable profit all the time with my clients, um, which is sort of the holy grail to me. Um, so it needs to be predictable in what it can, um, what it can generate because there are all those systems into place. Did I, did I hear those things right? Great. Yeah. Troy, add on to that. Um, in the best case scenario, and you'll never achieve this, but your goal as a franchisor is to, um, send somebody an email with a link to a Google drive or a drive or a thumb drive and, they can take this package of information, this box, this cute little gift that they buy, and Bob, the body shop owner, can go open that restaurant with zero additional support and information. Now, that's the goal. That's what you're striving to achieve. You will never achieve that, but that is to the degree of detail that your system has to be dialed in. To what Lauren said and what what you're asking about in stress testing, um, almost no, I'm not saying it's impossible, but almost no restaurant franchise system that has succeeded had less than three to five corporate stores across at least multiple micro markets, if even, you know, maybe multiple markets. But even let's just say you're in a major metro, something like a Los Angeles, a Houston, a Dallas, and Atlanta, you can get those sort of tertiary and different market metrics and demographic metrics off of that hub and spoke. But Typically, you're going to need three to five locations to, quote unquote, stress test because they're not all going to perform just because you have one store doing $3.6 million and 27% EBITDA. God bless. I know, (laughs) Chip, you talk a lot about profit, right? And how so many people are in the single, low, single digits. But, you know, just because it works there doesn't mean it works even three, five, ten miles away at the same performance. that's not necessarily a system, right? right? So this goes back. We need a system that is replicable. I always say a system is just a repeated set of actions. If it's, um, if it's repeatable, right, then it's scalable, which is, which is really what we're looking for. And I like this idea when you talk about Los Angeles or Atlanta or, or Houston, I think those are really good examples because they're huge sprawling cities with, with different, na- with micro markets, mm-hmm. um, within, you know, within the city limits and, and can each of the units perform profitably even though you're dealing with sort of different uh, demographics and 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 uh, economics and, and stuff like that, right? Yeah, Chip, I will add, because I think this point is so important and often overlooked. 
is when we build brands at full course, we do what's called geographic proof of concept. I am not interested in showing the next buyer that it works great just in one city. I have to show that it can work in multiple different regions that make sense for our development strategy, but also show flexibility of format when I'm doing that, right? So I think that that cannot be overstated that this proof that it works in multiple markets is a really big deal, especially in this day and age, as brands are rapidly becoming digitized and available in multiple formats, whether it's four walls or not, right? So you have to know that that brand can carry outside of its little pocket that it was born in. And and I think that that's absolutely critical and a wonderful point that Troy makes. So is this something, it sounds like you guys have had this conversation before. You're so adamant about it, which I love. Again, this is not something I would have ever mm-hmm. thought to ask. So I'm just trying to ask the stupid questions and, and you guys shower me with insights. Is, is this um, is this an example of something you might say? Yeah, it looks good. I love these two units. They're great. They're profitable. Um, here's what we need to see. Hey, do this over the next three years. Expand to two more markets and you know, let's have this conversation again in three years. Is is that part of uh, this journey? I mean, when we approach it, we build it into the journey. So part of our development spend and our plan for growing the brand includes additional company stores up to a certain amount. And we want to check a few boxes for that brand. Like, do we have flexibility of format? Check. Have we taken it outside of our home market? Check. Does it work in a digital footprint without four walls? Check. You know, we're looking for certain things that we know as a franchise are, are considered best in class. And I think a point here to make is really great franchisors are leveraging ghost kitchens and the digital digital delivery marketplace to be able to test new territories to see the receptiveness of the brand even before it's ever franchised there. And a really great example of this a few years back was Noodles & Co. Did a ghost kitchen, commissary kitchen just for their brand, corporate controlled it. It was in Chicago to help feed demand of that market. And then they made a really smart move and did the same thing pushing into California to check the California market's receptiveness to the brand as a potential franchise offering. And so think about it this way. As a franchisor, what's worse? Spending the money on a test and realizing it's not going to work yet or spending the money selling franchises that are going to fail. I would submit to you that the latter is way, way worse to any franchised brand. So it's not just thinking about, okay, you know, for the next buyer and for my exit as the franchisor, what am I doing to tee this up? But it's also protecting the brand and its current franchise system to make sure you're making smart geographic moves. And I cannot stress this enough. Yeah, I mean, it's mitigating your risk to a certain degree. Exactly, exactly. Troy, talk to me because we've talked about this certainly on the episode when you first uh, appeared here on the show. You talked about everybody has the next best thing. That's every conversation you have. It starts that way. How do you begin to know? And and by virtue, how can uh, a potential franchisor start to get to that answer? Like, hey, I think I got the next big thing. How do you go about figuring out whether you do have the next big thing? Um, almost anything can be willed into existence and almost everything has a buyer. It comes back to the first part of your previous piece of the question, which was, um, there's a lot of work to do before you're ready to, to franchise and the franchise or development journey, uh, is different for everybody. But there are commonalities and and really stress testing, optimizing, fine tuning, dialing in, not just for profitability, but nobody has every element of the package they need ready to go. There is checklists, there are manuals, there are and and if you have all of that, it has to be adapted to teach. It has to be adapted to be digested and utilized by somebody else who may not be the most experienced person in the industry. So there's adaption um, and, and and there's um, variance of all of these things that have to be checked off to Lauren's point. So it is a journey. It is not an overnight flip a switch, write a check. And, and we literally have people say, how much is it going to cost? I'm going to write the check. You do the work. Can we start selling in 90 days? Uh, 
Yeah, probably not, right? Right. Even the most successful franchise systems in this country today um, took three to five years to really get to a point where they hit a runway of, of a rocket ship if they're a rocket ship today. So there's a lot of background work. It's a process for folks like us and Lauren. Um, you know, I can only speak because I don't know Daryl's uh, everything about Daryl's history. Is is if, as long as the process is well laid out and well proven that it works, then follow that advice, pay for that advice, follow that system, get in on that journey and and listen to the folks who've done it before. The only people that are going to come up with a concept, open a restaurant on one or three to three stores and successfully pull this off without any help is an executive of a previous existing restaurant franchise brand that has done this already. That's the only people that pull that off. Otherwise, everybody else who believes they have something special and they may, um, has to do a lot of work to optimize it and get it ready. And very often, to sort of bust the bubble a little bit, very often what you have and what you run and what you know like the back of your hand today will have to look a little bit different, will have to adapt to markets, to venue models, and will have to adapt so that the franchisee can execute on that, right? So a little bit of a least common denominator. It's not going to be as crafty necessarily or as super special unique um, if you want to see it replicated uh, successfully. For sure. That's the, and that's the challenge, right? The thing that made you unique and individual differentiated is the reason why you are successful and or are considering growth. But uh, some of that gets, I mean, not to be callous, but like it has to get watered down because it needs to be able to be executed by a variety of people. Is that a, is that a fair way of saying it? Is that is that in a variety of places, in a variety of venue models, with a variety of types of operators? Yeah, when yeah you don't have a lot of and when you don't necessarily have a tight hand over it. Daryl, I want to go back to something you said because I think it was really, um, I think it was really interesting, and and it really resonated with me. Um, you had said, hey, if you're going to be a franchisor, you are going to have uh, you're going to be in a whole new business. Uh, if you like running restaurants, then continue running restaurants. But if you want to do something else, I mean, because this other thing is being a franchisor is is something else. So, so talk to me about that and maybe a little bit in your experience, having watched people jump from one to the other um, when they succeed and when they fail. Yeah. So, you know, to start it off, it, like I, I've been a franchisor. So my my world as a franchisor, um, you know, uh, it was retail, lots of, of leases on on the table, um, you know, 45, 48 uh, units. And my day in the life was going into the office and I, had, you know, our support office, our head office had about 12 staff. Uh, running the franchise system and you got everybody from your sales and, and your area developers that are servicing the franchisees to your marketing and, and uh, your accounting and, and internal, um, your, your negotiations, your legal side. You got all those little aspects. So if you want to become a franchisor, that's your world. Your, your, your world isn't, if, if you have a, you know, whether it's a restaurant franchise or whether it's a oil change franchise, doesn't matter. You're you're go you're not going to be in that business brand model. Um, I was in the supplement industry. I, I wasn't selling pills every day. I was teaching people and supporting people to sell pills every day. And so there was there was a difference behind being the franchisor. You you are then charged with helping and supporting and coaching other people in business. Now. Pop Menu has reimagined the restaurant. They're breaking the mold of the menu, taking the kitchen doors off the hinges, and serving up their most comprehensive technology solution yet, Pop Menu Max. It comes with the previous ingredients that we've mentioned here on this podcast, right? Uh, websites designed with SEO, marketing tools to keep you top of mind with guests, and of course, the patented interactive menu technology. This new recipe brings automated phone answering, third-party online order aggregation, waitlisting, and more to the table. Pop Menu's phone answering technology, for example, has your ringing phones covered. With artificial intelligence, the simple questions that used to keep your phone line tied up can now be handled without pulling a staff member from your in-person hospitality. No more missed reservations, no more asking for your hours or missed revenue, and that's just the beginning. 
You have a passion for food. Pop Menu has a passion for technology. Together, it's a recipe for restaurant success. Now, even more digital ingredients are in their technology pantry, and Pop Menu is helping restaurants attract, engage, remarket, and transact with their guests on a whole new level. Trust me, if you're a restaurant owner, you need Pop Menu to take your business to the next level. For a limited time only, get $100 off your first month, plus you lock in one unchanging monthly rate. Go to popmenu.com slash restaurant strategy to claim this offer. Again, that's $100 off your first month at P-O-P menu.com slash restaurant strategy. Again, that link is in the show notes. So I, I love this. Lauren, you're sort of nodding your head and smiling. And I assume this is at least part of what you do um, as part of the, the journey. How do you teach people to do this? And where do you have success? And where do you, where are their failures? Talk, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think um, one thing that I will highlight is we take a lot of pride in being able to cultivate our first franchisees out of our management teams and our restaurants. And that is because we spend a lot of time investing in education. And that is above and beyond the call of duty to really help people become a business owner. We really believe in uh, franchising as a you know a path to entrepreneurship and to business ownership and to do that you know, successfully and to open the door for our own employees within our brands, I think is a very special initiative that we have. So for us, we look at this as an investment in people first. And I think that if you are going to become a franchisor, that would be my suggestion that if you really think about it, you're investing in people and helping them open up their first business probably. And that is a deep investment and ongoing concern in how they're doing and how they're performing. And yes, at the end of the day, you will have some benefit as the franchisor, but I don't think that you can go wrong by thinking about this as an investment in people and creating opportunities for them. And I have never been steered wrong by this philosophy. And it's what was taught to me when I was um, coming on board as an executive at Focus Brands is it's always franchisees first. You know, you couldn't make a single business decision, a single case or an argument to do anything for a brand unless you could answer the question, how does this benefit our franchisees? And I think that if you approach franchising with that kind of philosophy um, of servant leadership and really creating opportunities, you, you can't go wrong. Troy, anything to add to this? Uh, Lauren is absolutely and always right. Um, the 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 situation of um ego has to go out the door to to her point audacity has to go out the door uh you're you're now taking people's money and you owe them um a lot of services but remembering that their success is your Mm -hmm. success the only way you are successful and drive revenue via royalty and other profitable uh, streams of income from this system is by driving their success so you have to be invested in them, not not assume that they're beholden or invested in you only. It's not a one-way scenario. And I would submit to Lauren's point, um, any form of over-investing in time, resources, money, uh, outside uh, assistance, et cetera, is always going to pay off um, in, in the sustainability and resiliency of the organization. And it's also going to help build the brand in the right way. You're going to end up with a much higher quality, better revered brand that has a chance at legacy. So as you put it this way, this actually sounds much closer to independent ownership than I previously thought in as far as when you grow from one to three locations or to five or to 10 locations, you suddenly can't be on the line. You can't be at the podium. You can't be on the floor. Already you're thinking systematically. You're thinking, okay, how do I manage by the numbers? How do I teach the GMs to, you know, to execute, you know, hit revenue targets and, and, and tether their expenses to et cetera, et cetera. You're already sort of doing that. Um, And then the next thing when you sort of, you know, you know, throw gasoline on the on the fire, so to speak, which is franchising, I guess, is that you just have to do that better than ever before and articulate better. And I mean, is that is that a fair assessment? Am I looking at that the right way? You have to do it for somebody else. 
You're no longer yeah. doing it for yourself. The motivation is not to build my independent group of restaurant businesses to the highest optimal potential, but to build your business with and for and alongside yeah. you. Great. Yeah. And I, um, I think, you know, even on the, the corporate side of, you know, to, you know, when, when you are in that stage of going, okay, you know what, I have three or five or eight units out there. Should I franchise? Should I not? Um, where should I go? The, the business model of corporate run businesses compared to franchise is, is so very different. And so I've had corporate stores and, and franchisees. Now a franchise model is about uh, trust, partnerships, business relationships. You, it's not dictatorship. Now, I, I use the word dictatorship because in a corporate environment, you are the boss. So you have the right to make one purchase decision, send a little bit of product to all your units, and they don't have a, a say in that matter. And But but that's that's the corporate model of being able to make those type of decisions. So comparing that is very different. So understanding that you can't take the uh, mentality of a corporate run business and think that you can franchise successfully that way because your franchisees won't stand in an environment of dictatorship. <laughs> yeah, I get that. That's interesting. Um, is there ever, uh, or maybe put a different way, uh, when what are the circumstances when a company might keep a certain amount of corporate stores and then also franchise beyond that? Is that ever advisable and uh, under what circumstances? Lauren, you're nodding your head. Yeah, 100%. I'll tell you how I look at it. And I work with, you know, nascent and very early stage brands. And so I look at corporate stores um, as serving a number of functions. One is they're a perfect testing ground for refining the brand and proving that it works in certain formats and geographic locations. Um, it allows us to show our franchisees that we have some skin in the game. Um, and number three, and most importantly, make no mistake, we model that cash flow and that profit margin through to the bottom line. And those company stores have a purpose financially and helping us support the growing overhead of starting a franchise organization. So we are looking at this like, okay, the brand is going to grow over time and its geographic footprint, but we also need to invest in the people who are behind the brand. So as we're tripling, quadrupling the size of this team in the next five to seven years, how are we going to cover that overhead. And for me, the simplest and fastest way to do that is a certain number of company stores that support a break-even point for the SGNA or overhead, whatever you want to call it, for the brand, even including its franchise organization and the necessary headcount to support it. That's sort of my two cents on it. Um, you know, you will get buyers who, you know, maybe they buy a brand from us in five to six years. They are not interested in operating company stores and they just refranchise them. They sell them and turn them into franchises. I've seen that. Um, but I like to have at least one company store for a brand and certainly vet out at least two to three company stores before we franchise. That's sort of how we approach it. I like that. Troy, you were nodding your head as well. What, anything to add here? Yeah, it, the first when you first asked the question, um, why would I listen to you it, it tell me what to do and how to do it if you no longer have a corporate store? Um, I also to Lauren's point, uh, I'm not your guinea pig. <laughs> Figure it out, try it out. If you fail, and by the way, the best and biggest brands spend and lose lots of money prototyping and testing and uh, all that great stuff with product and with um, equipment and systems and all kinds of things. Um, to the point of the people, absolutely. Um, if you're going to have 5, 10, 20, 30 corporate stores, um, those are an asset to leverage um, from not only um, experience and, and the people within those systems to help you uh, proliferate your brand, but, but they are still, again, different businesses. You are going to have a team of people that run those stores, and you're going to have a team of people that specialize in the franchise system model and support system. Can there be overlap and, and, and usefulness? Certainly. Mm -hmm. But um, 
I do see a lot of folks who do have five to 10 stores who think, oh, I've got all the people I need. Uh, th- this is easy. Um, I'm going to train them in my corporate store. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to send my corporate store managers out to train. Look, somebody who runs a corporate store for you is not necessarily, okay, I'll just say it, is absolutely not the best franchise onboarding and pre-opening trainer uh, in a franchise different system. Different skill sets, right? Uh, Troy, because, different skill sets. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's it's a little bit of that. We do it this way because we can, because there's less accountability, so to speak, versus I'm teaching you how to do it, and you're going to go do this without any support, so, quote unquote, direct support like I'm offering you today. So um, there's a lot in that, right? There's a lot of overlap, but there's also a lot of separation that has to happen to make that Love work. Daryl, anything to yeah. add here to this? Yeah, you know, I think that, um, you know, to Lauren's uh, point about uh, the, the, the training side, um, you know, as a franchisor, I always had corporate stores. And I think most franchisors always do because there's, there's a level of um, sometimes you're buying them back, sometimes you're taking them back, whatever the case may be. If it's a good brand and good unit, you're going to hang on to it. So I always fluctuated from, you know, that kind of, two to three, all the way up to six or eight at, at any given time. Now, I always wanted to keep one or two right in my own backyard because, again, from a the, the environment is always changing. So you want to use your own corporate store to test a new system before you roll it out to your franchisees. And either the market accepts it or they don't or whether it's a product or anything like that. So I always used my, my corporate units in my own backyard as my – testing for what I should or shouldn't roll. If I if I was coming out with a new POS system, you know, I, I would run it in our corporate stores first. And if it was successful, I'd roll it out to, to the franchise yeah. system. Yeah, I totally get it. So then let me ask the other side, because you guys are so adamant about this, which is great. Is there ever a circumstance when it would make sense for a brand to have no corporate stores? I've never seen any. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there are. No, they're, they're out, out there. there. The answer is absolutely not. There. They exist. Uh, I wouldn't invest in one personally. Um, I, I'm actually, th- there is there is too few and there is too many. Um, you kind of look at what's the motivation or what's going on. Uh, you get too many and you get in a situation where you're asking yourself, are they just picking off the best locations and am I getting sort of secondhand pick of territory or quality of corner? But um, but no, you, 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 no, no. Great. there's no situation where I would recommend anybody getting into a franchise system that doesn't have at least one corporate store. And by the way, if you go investigate this um, on a variety of websites, um, some massive brands in this world have none, one, or less than three corporate stores, massive mm-hmm. restaurant brands. But that doesn't mean they didn't. I, I will say this. There is there is a model where, uh, and we encourage this, um, if you're at three, get to five. If you're at five, get to ten or seven, seven or ten. You can always sell back down to two, three, five, right? So let's get your corporate situation set up, get that financial. And at some point, to Lauren's point earlier, the financials will flip. The royalties will kick in. Remember, there's a massive delay. If it takes two years from the day you meet them to the day they open their store, um, there's a massive delay and ramp up in royalty development. So um, at some point, you get to a point where that does pay for the infrastructure and does pay for the investment of growth of infrastructure. Um, but but that's going to be a while. And that's we're talking three, five, easy down the road, years. But you can always sell back some of those great corporate stores as franchises to folks, as ready-made, proven. And by the way, talk about valuation. They're, you're going to get a lot more for a business that's been running for two, three, five years and has a track record um, when you go to resell that. And, and you can be very selective about who picks yeah, those up. Great. Um, talk to me. Maybe I'll bounce this right back to you, Troy, and then we'll sort of go around the horn. Um, talk to me about the process. Uh, same kind of question I asked last week about somebody says, yep, I want to be a franchisee. I, I've sort of I figured out what, what brand I want to buy into. Same thing here. Talk to me Same about that here. process. And I know it's not a one size fits all here, but what um, what are so a rough timeline of how long it takes to get some of this done? You said it takes a couple of years to get that first check in. But talk to me about the sort of the, the process and a, and a rough timeline, what people can expect. 
Yeah, um, we we have our own very very specific process, but it, I'll put it in some really big buckets. Um, who are you? What are you about? What's your mindset? What's your leadership style? Do you get what you're stepping into? Um, how ready and refined is your business and business model? Um, how much foundation is there that we can use and build upon? Um, how ready are you to step in and um, wholly own this journey and process as a full-time responsibility? Are you ready to step out of the day-to-day operations of your current restaurant infrastructure business? Do you have the people set up under you that can step up and take control? Are you financially capable of funding the development of this organization and what it's going to take? And most often um, for us, that includes the building of a prototype store because most people who have three or five stores will tell us, even 10 stores, I still don't have exactly my vision Mm -hmm. executed. We need to flush that out, design it, and probably build it. So this process for us, on average, is a minimum of 18 months. We spend between 18 and 30 months with a operator owner who we vet and believe is capable and ready to go, going through this journey to now we're selling. Now, it could be six, nine, 11, 15 months in that we can start selling. We get them to that point, but there's the after we start selling process of the onboarding training, all the support stuff that goes with it. Um, And then it goes long tail into developing a marketing fund. By the way, you're going to own corporate stores. You're going to own a franchise business system company, and you're probably going to own a marketing management organization that manage that fund as a separate sort of I call it like a trust or a bucket entity that is separate from the franchise entity to have a separation of funds in, in my opinion it's what we recommend but um, that's the journey you're on uh, so so be mentally prepared um, it's a lot of work but if you have the right support and the right system um, and, and you're proper, properly mentally ready to go on that journey, uh, it can be a very, very rewarding journey, um, certainly. And, and it is a long journey, by yeah. the way, beyond beyond the development phase, right? Now now you're in a new business that um, you're going to have, you, 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 your first person you sign is five or 10 years or whatever your franchise agreement is. Um, you're now married to that person for that period. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Lauren, anything to add there to that as far as how you think about timeline? Yeah, so I I think about this a little differently and maybe in in buckets. So before we ever approach attorneys, um, franchise sales marketing people, um, hire franchise sales to work with our brands, we've already done a lot of that operational foundation work, if you will. And that usually takes us anywhere between nine months to a year. And that includes systems, refinement, you know, process definition, um, and, and I think there's a difference between getting it ready to franchise and getting it to a place where the business itself is a viable business model that can be franchised that meets those unit level economics metrics that we talked about earlier and the refinement that happens with every single franchise unit you open. And there is somewhat of a steep learning curve. So no, I just want to send this message out there. You know, no matter how perfect you think you have it, it is constantly being refined and improved by this process of bringing other people to sit at your table. And um, you have to get it you know, as good as you can to be part of that offering and to proceed through the franchise sort of offering and closing and opening franchise units. Certainly, I'm not encouraging you to do it halfway at all. You know, put your best foot forward, but also be open to a continual refinement process and have a feedback loop in place from the beginning, whether that's a franchise advisory council or a place for that kind of feedback from the field and your franchisees and their execution to come back to you as the franchisor. So you're getting better with every single unit you open. Cannot stress that enough. So I will say, I think from start to finish, when you start sort of the legal process to that first franchise being open, I'd say on the outside part, two years, assuming that you've got some of the operation stuff already buttoned up. Um, but I would also encourage you to make it a lifetime process as a franchisor of continually refining. Yeah. That's, 
I, and let me clarify because Lauren said what I should have said. <laughs> I just want to clarify in case what I said came across a, a little differently. Uh, it is it is every bit of nine months for us um, before um, you're getting your FDD prepared, mm-hmm. basically. So we, we very similar, Lauren, in, in your mindset that the business has to be optimized and readied and skilled up and um, – and, and filled with the right people and backfilled with the folks that are going to take over so that the current organization can move on to the new business. So I, yeah, I love it. Yeah, Daryl, anything to add here? Yeah. You know, there's, um, there's the, the two components that, that in the development of the franchise, you know, the, the timeline kind of aside there, you know, a lot of, of businesses will already have all the operational systems already developed and now they're just fine-tuning them for um, the franchise model what system that they most franchisors or brand new franchisors don't have is the sales side they they don't understand that you actually need to develop a system to generate the leads qualify the leads nurture the leads um, you know get over the hump of the FDD which you know, there's a tremendous amount of investors that goes to you at that stage because most most franchisees haven't seen an FDD. So you hit them up with a 150 or 200 page document, and and they you know they they don't know how to handle it. Now that entire side is another new system and a process that that if you want to get into that franchising game, I see it a lot where the franchisor says, you know what, I I can do this. I you know my my businesses are profitable all that but it's all based around the operations of the business it's not based around the the selling of the product which is now your investment in this franchise yeah i love that that's uh that's a really great point again i wouldn't have thought to ask it um we're coming to the end of our time together and uh, just like i did on the last time i'm going to pose the question to each of you um, what have I just been too ignorant to ask? What I don't know, uh, I don't know what I don't know. So what did I not think to ask on this franchise or side of the conversation? Um, Daryl, I'll, I'll bounce it right back to you. You can kick us off. Uh, what haven't you asked? Well, um, I, you know what, I, I think speaking as a former franchise or, uh, it is an amazing industry to be in. Um, and, and I would highly recommend it. I agree with the panel. It's, it's not easy. So as long as you go in with eyes wide open that you're, you're building this career and you're building this business and this organization, which is going to scale to 50, 100, 300 units, um, you know, and it's going to take you 10 or 15 years. I, I think it's an amazing model. And there's, you, you do have to have that, um, that love to help another person. And, and, and that's where, if, if you're going to be a franchisor, you know, as the panel has said, it is about helping and supporting and, and teaching others how to generate profits and build businesses. It's no longer about you. Your job is now a coach, a consultant, uh, you know, somebody to support somebody else to build their business. Yeah, I love that. Lauren, what, uh, what did I not think to ask? And uh, what should people know? Yeah, I I think people should know that franchising is not the only way to grow their business. And you should evaluate franchising for your true motives, right? And your end game result, because it is really something that I believe should be done in service to others. And if your heart is not in it, people will know it'll be that much harder of a hill for you to climb and sell franchises and have successful franchisees. So I do want to encourage people to treat franchising as one of many ways that they can grow their business, but to take it very seriously. It is not a short play. It is not a way to scale you because you can't figure out how to scale yourself. It is not a a way to turn your unprofitable business into a profitable model for yourself. It is so much more than that. And I say that with a ton of reverence for that type of growth, obviously, as both a franchisor and a franchisee. And so what I will say in close there is really evaluate the pros and cons of all of the ways to grow your business and include franchising in that list. Yeah, I love it. Troy. Beautifully said. Um, 
there are no shortcuts. Uh, if you Google uh, franchise my restaurant, um, don't click on any of those links. Don't call any of those people unless it says full course uh, on it or maybe KRP. Uh, but the, the, the there is there is a there there is a side of this business that has um, not the most positive reputation and um and it's because shortcuts have been taken uh there are no shortcuts um there are a lot of industries you can franchise much faster much cheaper much uh at a higher scale uh and and daryl's a great example of that uh it, you know if you're asking about creating a window washing franchise system um that's a very different conversation than the restaurant business as we all understand not only the complexities and the risks um and and the just the competitiveness in the restaurant industry. So I would say in closing, there absolutely are no shortcuts. Uh, you're not going to do this for twenty-five dollars to $50,000 in 90 days um, or 100 days. And uh, anybody who tells you otherwise, uh, you should avoid. Um, and, and I don't I hate to be the negative Nelly guy, but, um, but it, to echo everybody else's sentiments, um, it's not for everybody. And if it's for you, uh, you'll know because you'll continuously be interested, excited, and, and passioned by everything you learn along the way. If, um, if you're not, then it's certainly not for you. This episode really stemmed out of uh, a couple of Q&A episodes I did. So I, I do this every so often where I sort of uh, reach out to my list. I reach out to the listeners. I say, hey, uh, I try to cover a lot on the show, but what have I not covered? What specific questions? And we sort of do a, a series of questions all in a row. And we got a couple of people asking about franchising, um, which surprised me because that's not what uh, most of the listeners um, I find are, are typically interested in. But there were enough people uh, that I just thought, oh, okay, I think I've uh, I think I've turned a blind eye to this, and I think it's time that we address it. Um, and I feel like we've done uh, we've done a really thorough job, um, you know, on the second step to the pool. And I think uh, it's I'm very well aware of uh, the fact that uh, there, there's a huge pool and a deep end uh, that we didn't have time to cover here. But I think for anybody who's sort of on the fence considering it, um, I think we've given them some really good counsel as to sort of where to go, where to go next. Um, so I appreciate all of you being here. I'm gonna go around the horn really quickly, uh, let the listeners know uh, where they go learn more about you, what you do, um, and, and get in touch if they feel like they need to get in touch. Lauren. Yeah, so Full Course works with restaurant and food brands of all sizes and levels of maturity to help them figure out what their growth should look like and could look like. So we work with nascent brands all the way down to one unit or that are in incubation as an idea all the way through 200 plus units or more. Uh, we can provide educational services through our foundation consulting services through our management and development teams. And also we invest in early stage brands. You can learn more at fullcourse.com and on all forms of social media, we are at full course official. Absolutely. And the links will be in the show notes there. Daryl. Uh, yeah. So you can find anything that I do at uh, sangsterfranchisegroup.com. Um, you know, I, I work specifically with franchisors um, because when I was a former franchisor, I found it alone. Um, there, there was a lot of services supporting the franchisee, but, but nobody was helping to educate or mentor the franchisor. So, um, you know, when, when I got into this space, uh, I, I decided that I was going to just teach and work with the franchisor side. Um, of course, I do have uh, courses as well. So, you know, check out all that stuff at uh, sangsterfranchisegroup.com. Perfect. That link, of course, again, will be in the show notes. Finally, Troy. Uh, similar to Lauren, I would say uh, just go to fullcourse.com. That's the best uh, option you have. Uh, but, if, but if you'd like to have a conversation and 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 get a little bit more of uh, these things out of me, uh, it's krpusa.com, Kiwi Restaurant Partners, USA.com, and on social media, particularly LinkedIn, Kiwi Restaurant Partners, or Troy Hooper. 
uh, easy to find, easy to get a hold of. Always happy to uh, answer questions and uh, give people great Lovely. advice. Lovely. This show just turned uh, four, and uh, it's my very great privilege um, to sit here and have really great conversations. I'm constantly learning every single week. Um, not only do I conduct these interviews and, and record these episodes, but I listen to each and every one uh, because um, my mind is working in overdrive as I try to guide the conversations um, that I miss half of what we talk about. Um, before we uh, hit record, Troy was talking about how much he enjoyed uh, the conversation I had with uh, Lauren just, uh, just a little while ago. And I felt the exact same way uh, because every Monday, uh, it's the first thing I do. I go on a run and I and I listen uh, to the things. And I was like, "Wow, that was, it's really it's really good." It's it's my very real pr- pleasure to have these conversations. I didn't know ninety percent of what we talked about today, um, and that sort of guides me because if I didn't know, I got to assume other people didn't know. Um, so I'm hoping that the listeners got a, a lot of value. And so on their behalf, I thank all three of you uh, for taking time out of your days uh, to, to, to do this conversation, to hold this conversation. Um, again, all the links are in the show notes so you can learn more uh, about uh, anything that these guys are doing. Um, I appreciate all your wisdom, your insight, your generosity. Um, that's the, the best part about what I do um, is create these uh, these communities. And if I'm just sort of like the maitre d' in the middle, just kind of putting tables together. And uh, And so, guys... Thank you so much for being here. Uh, listeners, uh, I hope you got a ton of value. And if you've got further questions, please do reach out to these guys. They're the real deal. Thank you very much, guys. I will see you later. Thank you, Chip. Thank you, Chip. Thanks, Chip. Great job. Once again, I want to thank all of our panelists for taking time out of their day to uh, sit and chat with me uh, last week and this week. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be here. Hopefully, you got some value out of last week's conversation and certainly uh, this week's conversation. Again, if you're curious to learn more about my mastermind program, get in touch. Visit restaurantstrategypodcast.com slash schedule. Set up a free 30-minute call with me. There's no pressure to move forward. That call is absolutely free, but we'll get to learn more about each other and see if you're a good fit for the program. If you are, we can talk about next steps from there. Uh, I'm I'm, uh, profoundly touched that all of you guys take time out of your day every single week to sit here uh, and join me. Hopefully you get as much value out of this as I do. I learned a ton these last couple weeks as I do each and every week speaking to the guests that I get to speak to. Appreciate you. I appreciate all that you you try to do every single week. I am here for you. Uh, I, I love this community we're building. Thank you very much, and I will see you next time.